but uh, can it be too much? And this is like one of the things that prevented me from uh, joining in the first place is that it can be take a lot of time uh, and you have to you have to be careful what you put up there do you want people to know everything about you and what you're doing do you want them to know where you are uh, it takes time to keep things up to date so now like somebody sent me an email and I have to write a letter to respond to them and it's not just a simple thing like yes it's more like uh, this is what I've been doing for the past 10 years so this is not something that is um, without it doesn't it's not for free you don't it doesn't it takes time to be part of the the world and be part of a social network and some people just quit and don't respond and that's uh, of course an option so there's also there's been some news articles about are social networks just an advantage and advantage or there's also are they also a threat to people some um, young people have uh, overload and they can't uh, they feel like there's too much pressure on them and it's part of being so uh, visual to everyone uh, IP telephony um, yeah uh, I'm before we used to pay for dedicated uh, least, uh, fast lines and now uh, with internet and applications we are able to take advantage of uh, voice communications and video communications without making use of the um, traditional end-to-end -end call. Uh, we're still making use of the same network and somehow we're paying we're just uh, changing our payment models. We're not paying for each individual call necessarily, uh, but we are paying for a, a data uh, agreement that allows us to, to use the internet more from different locations. So, but uh, still I have some, like, uh, some agreements that allows me to do uh, more data sending when I'm in a different country and uh, this can also be of uh, use, but uh, applications like Skype or Viber combines uh, pictures and telephone. And talk about the progression of Skype uh, from a half million registered users to who knows, probably, um, how m I have no idea how many people use it today. So this is a timeline, this is the ARPANET experiments with digital signal processing. Uh, IEEE publishes a paper protocol packet network. This is like the progression of IP trans transmission. And then um, we have uh, 2010, the first LTE deployments take place. Voice over IP. Uh, you can uh, read through this. I'm not going to go through the the history of the IP telephony. So you can read this when you when you look at it on the on the web page. Um, the first voice over IP uh, application was in 1995, and then um, yeah, I think. Um, There have been problems with firewalls, and that um, uh, Skype solved the problem with local routing, and the PC uh, manages the connection. Um, there's some talk about system quality that, depending on the type of line you have, you may not have. Uh, a good voice quality or you might not have uh, the ability to even support the video but this has been in increasingly improving uh, also when you have greater bandwidth it has been improving uh, they also 
improve the application itself. And um, it also in encourages regular providers to have to improve their quality in order to keep their customers. So why would people pay for a telephony service if they can get it for free? So there also is pressure also on the companies to make improvements. And uh, what is the long-term evolution of voice over IP with higher bandwidths? Uh, you can have better quality for lower cost, and that um, voice <coughs> eventually becomes a commodity, and the conversation becomes a commodity. So it's more like what you're doing uh, with the network and not the infrastructure itself that matters. So you'll be able to play games uh, and um, partake in social networks, uh, but it doesn't, the network itself is not where you're making the money, but it's the applications where you'll be making the money. So companies have to think about that in terms of their business model that you no longer make money on the infrastructure itself, but on the services. Um, Multi-core uh, CPUs. Um, we have um, higher needs for maybe processing uh, graphics, for example, or the computers have the <coughs> some have been developing multiple core CPUs. And um, this can be used for s specific purposes, for things that require a lot of uh, processing. And, um, but um, there has been some maybe delay in uh, the adoption of this type of technology. And that's because that you need to rewrite the software and the drivers to be able to make use of pre-existing services. So there is, um, with any technology, there's a migration, and that there may not be a need for uh, all devices to have multiple core. So like I said, the, the, the importance of the device, like a laptop, may not be that it doesn't need to be so powerful. And so it depends what you're using it for. And you, if it's just something you're using as a terminal, then you don't need multi-core CPU. But if you're using it for specific like uh, rendering of uh, of video or um, a visualization of uh, um, creating um, games, for example, uh, then maybe you need to consider having multi-core CPU. But anyway, there's um, it's one of the newer developments. Probably uh, one of the most important developments is um, cloud computing. It has an important meaning for uh, businesses today. Uh, Google makes use of cloud and Gmail and Facebook and Google Docs and Amazon. These are enabling you to um, store some of your applications on servers elsewhere, and you don't need to know where, the, where it's stored. The programs can run from anywhere, and they can segment the intelligence of uh, your service to different locations. Um, an example of this, and let me just There's a company called 247office.com. Well, that's their web address anyway. And they create things, services like ERP solutions in the cloud. So they are in partnership with a lot of different people that provide different types of services. And they allow you to access those services through cloud computing. So if you look, take a look at their website, it's a Norwegian company. Uh, they're providing all kinds of um, 
ERP services to clients and many of their clients are also their partners and they're making use of cloud computing to do that. So it just shows that the, the um, value is not in the infrastructure necessarily but is in the application. And when you can separate the application from the infrastructure, uh, there's a great potential for, uh, for profits. Um, so maybe it's possible to um, to run a virtual machine or a series of virtual machines uh, rather than physical. And the virtual machine can have its own operating system. Yeah. And then you can uh, deal with security issues uh, on based on the virtual machine basis and not on the physical machine. Um, the some of the um, the threats or that um, some people worry about giving away their data, and that uh, there may be. Um, uh, risk that the um, the competition knows what you're doing, and that uh, that somebody may have access physically to your data. So it's important to have not only standards in the agreements, but also you have to have um, trust in the organization that provides you with the cloud services. You have an, an agreement and and you have reassurances from that organization. So you have to have some sort of agreement with the organization to follow up on data security. So like this company has to provide the security aspect in their, in their agreement. Um, digital photography. <coughs> as uh, so much uh, more flexible and convenient and easy to use than traditional photography and um, and it's um, the cameras have been in existence for quite some time I've had a digital camera since 2000 and it's uh, evident because of that's when my pictures are available to me I can find them again whereas if you print pictures it's very likely that you've lost track of them and you didn't have so many in the first place. So um, it has many advantages and gives some history about uh, digital cameras. And uh, it says the first uh, telephone camera was in 2001. I didn't have a telephone camera until maybe 2004, but I had a digital camera before then. And this kind of changed the industry where companies like Kodak that would make a lot of money on developing film and pr creating film uh, had to change their business model as well. So there's still some market in creating the devices, but also um, uh, what do you do with the... There's what do you do with the pictures afterwards? Uh, this can also be a, a market for the future. Like, uh, do you uh, print out the pictures at any point? Do you need to save them in some sort of a uh, journal and share them with people? Uh, how do you share people? How do you share pictures? So this can also be something that's a, a business but uh, you have to think about the, the business model. Uh, something, some more historical information. It says before you used to take pictures to, to make, to remember something. 
and maybe you would have um, like pictures of your grandfather and what happened a hundred years ago but uh, today uh, it's no big deal to create pictures and share pictures and then you can even delete them or you can send them on to others and it's no big deal you create a lot of selfies and um, yeah but how do you preserve photos for the future like how do you know what the standard is going to be in the future to be able to read these things so I have a lot of pictures on on the little uh, SD cards and uh, unless I transfer them to something else how do I know that I'm going to have a device that reads this this uh, card in the future 100 years from now you could say that if you put them on the internet then there's some sort of reserve for them but that's also you know who's going to be in control of the internet in the future so there's always been a preservation problem and maybe for individuals it's not such a problem but for like national companies and for uh, nations that want to preserve information it's always an issue about how do you preserve information how do you keep this in the long term and how do you manage a large amount of photos what do you do with all of this stuff so <clears throat> I have a grandmother who's turning 100 years old in a couple months and uh, sh one of the things they want to give her is a, a blanket that has in embedded in it pictures from our lives in this blanket and we have um, to find pictures that we can put in there and luckily I have this is why I know I have <laughs> A digital camera since 2000 because I know I've had to send these pictures to my sister who's going to put these things together and I think I sent her maybe 30 pictures because she's gonna pick like five from each person and 30 pictures out of uh, like 15 years of pictures is not much <laughs> but to have to go through all this stuff is amazingly difficult and to be able to to find things so um, you can imagine the, the data management problem with uh, with pictures and um, so part of uh, the products are they have a lot of advantages but there's also the management of information that becomes a problem in the future on the individual sense and on the on an organizational sense if organizations are dealing with this <coughs> this is one of the issues that people talk about big data issues because companies are acquiring more and more data and that uh, how do you manage this data in the company and how do you use it uh, because it's not just good enough to have it there but you need to be able to use it so that's a topic for another time um, I don't know about this project uh, but um, maybe if you do some kind of search you might be able to find out more about this mm. so. Uh, drone planes or unmanned planes uh, most frequently thought about its use in the military um, being able to find the baddies and and shoot them down but um, I think um, um, yeah so used in uh, GP with GPS and uh, in the intelligent um, radio control AI is used in the in the programming of the drone planes and um, it has advantages and disadvantages some of the disadvantages are that uh, maybe you pick the wrong target maybe involve people that are innocent in this and then um, uh, but it can also be used for other purposes too so uh, we most often think about it in terms of using it with the military but you might also be able to use drones with other uh, uses like finding lost people if people are lost in the in some sort of a uh, mountainous area or in an avalanche or something you could be using it did you want to Yes. Mm. Yeah. Okay. 
So then it would have been better if a drone could drop the water or yeah, hmm. the drones they use for Okay. So they uh, they actually use some drones. I didn't yeah. realize that. Yeah, they use okay. It's yeah. Hmm. 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 Um I was gonna say that you could use the drones to actually fight forest fires and uh, in these areas where it's extremely hot and it's very dangerous for people's lives to be able to have to go to these areas and and put out fires, you can instead send in drone planes to do that. So there's actually some useful applications for this, um, and it's as with all technology, it depends how it's applied, as whether it's good or bad. Um, yeah. And then uh, rovers are kind of like drones, they use the same kind of AI, and um, you can say that um, it has cameras for sensing things, and maybe it has some sort of uh, communication function in being able to collect things. Uh, but um, but the, like the drones uh, flying, these are on the ground. And you might have rovers that uh, exist not only on the foreign planets, like Moon or Mars, but they could also be used at the bottom of the sea, like in oil production, and being able to find, like when uh, something is broken, pipeline, and then fix it. Uh, it's better to be able to send in the technology than to risk people's health and lives. So um, it also is a useful application for, for rovers right here on, on Earth. Um, <coughs> They also make an example of um, uh, uh, trucks, and um, one example might be, for example, of painting the center line on a on a highway. Instead of having someone driving a truck, you might be able to um, have a a uh, rover or artificially intelligent driven vehicle paint the line. Okay, so it's you can judge the exact distance from the side of the road and do a perfectly straight line. Another example might be the technology that's used in everyday cars, like the backup the camera and the anti-crash signal. When you're getting too close to something, it starts to beep. And um, this might also be extended to being able to use the car in driving situations as well. When you get too close to a car ahead of you, there's some sort of a signal that indicates that. So you could think about technologies in different degrees, extending um, the automation of the, of the vehicle. Okay. Um, <coughs> there's um, lots of developments in IT technologies. Uh, we have um, We have um, a lot of Wi-Fi and mobile technologies, and it's not just the app, it's not just the tablets and the end devices that are important, but it's the applications that are used with these. So, for example, again, using cars. Now, cars can have Wi-Fi in them, and uh, you, in the U.S., they have like a system where you can purchase Wi-Fi radio and you can hear radio broadcasts from across the country. So if I'm in New York, I can hear broadcasts in Los Angeles. However, that's uh, only one application. You could also use it in, say, roadside assistance. So you could um, communicate with a service provider, maybe AAA. If you get stuck, you could communicate that you, where you are and that uh, you need help and that they would send, be able to send someone to help you. So, and you could use it for um, voice communications, telephone, call somebody up. So this could be integrated also into the vehicle itself. Um, <coughs> other technologies like um, uh, USBs enable you to have huge amounts of data now. I have, I think, a two terabyte uh, USB stick. It's ridiculous. It's like uh, on this little tiny thing. And then, um, uh, we have um, electronic paper. I haven't. Um, uh, there's some. We have some discussion about this in one of the later lectures. So, 
I need to look into what is the most recent uh, technology there. And then uh, touch screens, these are extremely important for people uh, that also have um, for regular users, but also for people with disabilities, uh, being able to um, move around in the in an, in the computing environment by just um, by by just touch and being able to make things larger for people that have uh, sight um, limitations, and also there should there is a development of controls that allow you to uh, interface a computing device with your mind. So that for people that actually can't move any appendages, there are some programs that are being developed to allow people to move a pointer uh, with their mind by training the pointer to the system to pick up the, the frequency waves that come from their own mind. So <coughs> that's kind of uh, really almost, it's in the future, but it's almost, almost there. And these are kind of uh, very interesting new interfaces that allow people to interact with uh, information and, and technology. We talked about digital TV and radio the other day, and um, yeah, uh, being able to fit more information on the same, uh, um, being able to deliver more channels to your home by use of uh, digital media and um, being able to also be able to use two-way communications and um, yeah. um, and then 3D films is uh, was a recent development but I uh, it's, it's only been in use basically for entertainment and maybe um, there's there's a technology which is um, being used um, it's it's a 3d technology on the you use with a headset set and it has a called oculus rift and this allows you to be able to see uh, whatever is like on your screen in a virtual world inside the glasses and it feels like it's 3D and um, it's a very immersive experience and these types of environments where they've been used only for entertainment before it can also be used for education and for demonstration so you can use it as a as a walkthrough to see a new building you could use it as a, uh, a learning tool to be able to um, maybe get uh, what it feels like to be inside like a ship or something like that so you can you can use it for educational purposes as well and that's the hope that these uh, technologies are applied in new applications in the future so, okay. um, so that's just trying to highlight some of these and if you want to um, go to the original article I'm sure you could still probably find it, although I haven't looked for it. <laughs> Phi triple E spectrum. And it's the top 11 technologies of the decade. And I believe this was from 2010, but you'd have to look it up. So. OK, so that's all we have for today. and. Um, uh, next time we will talk about, next Tuesday we'll talk about chapter three and I have a slide set about co-creation design which was also some of the topic of chapter two. So. Okay, is there any questions regarding the administration of the class? Or okay. Otherwise, we're done.